Um, and this and this degree, um, together with my personal family um, experience, really fostered my interest and passion in not only understanding cancer, but importantly, how we can better improve treatment for cancer patients. So I work here at the Trinity Translational Medicine Institute, or TTMI, which as you can see is based on site here at St. James's Hospital. This is our building here. Um, and it's also the location of the Trinity St. James's Cancer Institute. And our physical proximity to the hospital means we are really fortunate to work with quite a diverse um, and multidisciplinary team, um, including scientists, surgeons, pathologists, nurses and oncologists, which importantly places the patient at the centre of the team. And in this case, it's bowel cancer patients, as bowel cancer is the cancer type that I study. And this cancer occurs in the large intestine or the rectum. And in Ireland, bowel cancer is the third most common cancer and the second most common cause of cancer death, with almost 3,000 new patients diagnosed with this disease every year. And in particular, I study bowel cancer that occurs in the lower part of the bowel or the rectum, and about one in three of all patients with bowel cancers will have cancer that occurs in this location. And so if we talk a little bit about treatment, following their diagnosis, the majority of patients with bowel cancer will receive a combination of drugs or chemotherapy and radiation, and this is followed by surgery to remove their tumor. And if we look at the radiation, we know that this is helpful for some patients. So for about three in 10 patients following radiation, their tumor will get smaller or completely disappear. And this means that they respond to treatment. However, unfortunately for many bowel cancer patients, about seven in 10 patients, following radiation, their tumor does not shrink in size and it may grow bigger or remain the same size, meaning that they're resistant to treatment. And really for these patients, they're unfortunately going to suffer from all of the unpleasant side effects that we associate with cancer treatment without receiving any of the benefit. So we want to know how we can improve treatment for resistant patients. So for this project, we asked, well, can we improve treatment for bowel cancer patients by looking at the immune system? And I study a really particular part of the immune system. So how I like to explain this is, if we imagine our body as a castle, the immune system essentially is the army that defends the body from foreign invaders such as bacteria, viruses, and sometimes cancer cells. And we all know that a really important part of any army is the part that keeps watch for danger and can sound the alarm to inform others that help is needed. And within our immune system, there are a group of proteins that do this job, and they're called complement proteins. And they'll be the part of the immune system to not only recognize danger, but alert and recruit immune cells so that they can travel to the side of the body where that danger is and then eliminate it. So how can we study this in the lab? Well, we can grow cancer cells in the lab. And um, these are cancer cells that originally came from a patient many years ago and that can grow um, for long periods of time. And we can grow them in these containers called flasks and we keep them in incubators at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. And importantly, we work with them in special environments which are biosafety cabinets to ensure that everything um, maintains in, is maintained in a sterile environment. And these are just some pictures of some of my cells that I grow in the lab and how they look down the microscope. So how can we study complement proteins in bowel cancer? So I'm doing this in two ways. So I'm looking at these bowel cancer cells that we can grow in the lab to see if complement proteins are present. And also we study um, patient tumor biopsies and blood samples that have been donated to us by consenting bowel cancer patients. And then we can investigate whether complement is present um, in these biopsy and blood samples. So what have I discovered so far in my PhD? Well, when I started in the lab, we wanted to know, can we kill bowel cancer cells in the lab with radiation? And we grow many kinds of bowel cancer cells and we can give them x-rays similar to how a patient would receive radiation. And what we found was that when we gave some bowel cancer cells x-rays, the cancer cells died away, similar to the tumor of a patient who responds to radiation therapy. However, we noticed that when we gave other bowel cancer cells x-rays, the cancer cells didn't die away and they survived the radiation, similar to the tumor of a patient who's resistant to radiation. So the answer was yes, we can kill bowel cancer cells in the lab with radiation, but some of them easier than others. So after this, we asked, well, are there complement proteins present in these bowel cancer cells? And the answer was yes. We saw there are complement proteins in all of the bowel cancer cell lines that we study. However, really interestingly, 
we saw that there were much more complement proteins present in these bowel cancer cells that are resistant to radiation. So we chatted about this and we thought, well, maybe if, if we remove complement proteins from these radiation resistant bowel cancer cells, would that make them easier to kill? So we worked on this for about a month or so, and we took our radiation resistant bowel cancer cells and we removed a specific complement protein. Then we gave them extra radiation again. And really interestingly, this time we saw that they were much easier to kill with radiation. So it seemed that the complement was helping the cancer cells to survive radiation. So the answer was yes, they are easier to kill when we remove these complement proteins. So as we saw this link between complement um, and whether the cancer cells could survive radiation or not, we asked, well, is what we're seeing in the lab happening in patients? And as I explained at the start of this talk, following treatment, while some bowel cancer patients will respond, some will also be resistant. So what we did was we asked some bowel cancer patients, could we have a sample of their blood before they started this treatment so that we could analyze it in the lab? And we asked, are there complement proteins present in this patient blood? And the answer was yes. There was lots of different kinds of complement proteins present in the blood. But really interestingly, when we looked at the levels of these proteins in the blood, we saw that patients that were resistant to treatment had much higher levels of complement proteins in their blood compared to patients that responded to treatment. They had lower levels. So what do we hope to achieve from this and what can we, what can we do with this knowledge? Well, if we look at the treatment for bowel cancer currently, as I explained, bowel cancer patients will receive chemotherapy and radiation. And while some will respond, many will not. So in the future, our goal, and certainly with a lot more research, would be that perhaps when bowel cancer patients come into the clinic, before they start treatment, we could perform a blood test to look at complement proteins. Then we could divide patients up based on what's likely to work best for them. So some patients could receive chemotherapy and radiation. Others could perhaps receive an alternative therapy or go straight to surgery, and more patients would be likely to respond. In terms of my ongoing experiments, we really want to try and understand the relationship between bowel cancer cells and immune cells. So we're looking at this at the moment to try and understand if they can communicate using complement proteins. We also really want to try and understand how these complement proteins seem to be helping cancer cells to survive radiation. So we want to know what other proteins are involved. And next month, I'll be traveling to Oxford to work with Dr. Monica Alcina's lab to try and answer this question. So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody in the Department of Surgery, in particular, my fantastic supervisors, Dr. Neve Lynham lennon and Dr. Joanne Lysat, and the Irish Cancer Society for funding this research, and most importantly, the patients who so kindly donate samples to research, because without them, none of this would be possible. So I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Rebecca. It was brilliant. Um, so I see we have some questions coming in. Um, so one that, um, atten attendee has asked, how do you remove complement proteins from cells in the lab? Can you use the same method to remove complement proteins from in patients? <laughs> Thanks, William, for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the lab, we can basically um, remove complement proteins from the cells by um, essentially programming the cells to stop producing them. So we've shown that in our lab, the cells are actually making them themselves. So we can go in and switch that off so that they can't produce them anymore. In terms of whether we could do this in patients, um, obviously in patients it's a little bit different because you've got to access the specific site. Um, but this technology potentially in the future could be similar to something that we could do with patients with, with a lot more work. We have um, another question um, from Simon. Were you still able to do your research uh, during COVID? Yeah, so COVID, thank you for the question, Simon. COVID's been really challenging, I think, for researchers everywhere. Um, our research institute was closed for about four months um, completely. And then after that, we still had to practice um, kind of social distancing and we had the lab at reduced capacity. So in terms of actual wet lab research, no, I wasn't able to perform anything for, um, I'd say the guts of six months. And um, we had lots of delays with deliveries. But um, when I was at home, I just did um, research, reading the literature um, and kind of keeping up to speed with that. So yeah, it was a, it was a tough time for everybody, I think, but, but we're pretty much back to normal now, so. 
Uh, Simon just wrote another comment. Well done to you and the great work you're doing. We're very lucky to have you. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, we have another question here from Rob. He says, might there be a different, might there be different effects anticipated with different kinds slash doses of radiation therapy? Or is the effect very similar among different types of radiation treatment? Yeah, thanks, Rob, for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for this research so far, we've just been using um, a clinically relevant dose of radiation. So that would be the fraction that the patient would receive. Um, I haven't yet investigated that with larger doses of radiation, but I think it's a great um, it's a great question. I'd certainly expect that there may be different effects anticipated. I know in other cancer types um, that there are different effects, whether whether you give fractions of radiation or, or larger bolus doses. So um, to answer your question, I'd say, yeah, there might be different effects. Um, but for this case, we've just looked um, we've just gone with a clinically relevant dose. So. So yeah, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to answer that question. Great. Um, and I actually have a question. I was wondering, yeah. um, do you know why there are more complement proteins in some patients? Like, is it a specific type of bowel cancer or is it just kind of random? We don't know yet. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, at the moment, um, we're lucky we performed when we looked at the blood samples, we performed this with our collaborators in Norway. And we're really lucky that this is linked to a lot of um, kind of clinical data as well. So um, I've looked at this in, in the context of things like obesity. Um, and at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any difference between patients when we break them up on different characteristics. Really the most important thing, which is good for us because it's what we're interested in is, is response to treatment. So um, yeah, at the moment, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure why, but um, yeah, maybe hopefully soon we can kind of, um, we can kind of understand why that is a bit more. Mm -hmm. There might be somebody else's PhD project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the next PhD yeah, in the lab. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's one more question, and it yeah. says, um, if you're switching off complement protein, can this have a negative effect on a patient? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, I guess I couldn't go into this in too much detail in the talk, but thank you for your question. Um, there's actually many different kinds of complement proteins um, so in this case we just um, focused on one so um, the other complement proteins would, would have still been present in the cells um, but you're right um, you know everything in the body is a balance and we know that in the normal immune response these proteins are really important every day in kind of controlling um, how um, our body and um, doesn't essentially get overrun by things like bacteria and viruses. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great comment. It's definitely something that needs to be considered um, in the balance of, of how much complement is there and how much isn't. So yeah. Well, thank, thank you. This, there's one more question that kind of leads on from that. And it's saying, um, let's take this as the last question. Um, what is the cutoff between responders and non-responders? And they also said this great presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that's also a great question. So we would work with the um, clinical team in the hospital for this. So following, um, following their surgery, um, the tumour would be examined by, by the pathologists and it's assigned a score. Um, there's, it's a five point grading score. So basically it's just assessed for how many tumour cells are present. Um, and we would um, divide that up um, into responders and non-responders. So we would we would use the pathologist's um, um, discrimination with that. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rebecca. But I think we'll leave it there and we'll Thanks go on to you. our next talk. But thank you so much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So next up, we have Dr. Siddiq Duda. So Dr. Da has a PhD in cancer genetics and has previously worked as an Irish Cancer Society funded postdoctoral research fellow at UCD and RCSI. He now leads the epigenetics of gastrointestinal diseases research group within the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences at the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland and his research group is focused on understanding how specific chemical modifications on DNA impact development and progression of colon cancer and inflammatory bowel diseases. So the talk today, developing a new therapeutic option for the treatment of bowel cancer, will focus on ongoing research being carried out in Dr. Das's group, which involves modifying an FDA approved drug for the treatment of bowel cancer. So over to you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. And thank you to the Irish Cancer Society for the kind invitation. This is really an event that I absolutely look forward to every single year. 
Um, so oh, I suppose sorry. what I'm going to... So if you can just see your um, presenter slides. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Yeah. One second. Um, so let's stop this one thing. Now, is that better? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay, great. So um, I suppose um, what I'm going to try and do today um, as a part of the, as a part of this talk really is to try and um sorry once again i'm just going to try and see if i can just move this um if i just call this slideshow hopefully that works okay yeah does that look okay the screen is just dark oh sorry one second zoom share is that okay yeah, we can see the first slide again. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Sorry, apologies for that. So um, what I'm going to try and do in the next couple of minutes really is try and give you an idea in terms of what work we have been doing over the past couple of years, uh, really trying to improve current therapeutic options and also try and answer the question as to why treatment options in bowel cancer really, um, in certain instances, don't work the way that we expect them to work. So the first question there really is that what is cancer and um you know and i think this is this is a question that we all kind of think okay maybe you know um when you probably go to a pub and people ask well why haven't we still found a cure to cancer and i think the reason for that really is that if we think about cancer as as such as a disease itself cancer is not one but a, but really is a complex um of several diseases and when we look at what we call as the hallmarks of cancer or the very characteristic features of cancer, this to a great extent will explain to us why, um, you know, why it is so hard to treat cancer. And in particular, as you can see over here in this in this image here, we have a number of different factors, uh, parts that Rebecca touched upon in her previous talk in terms of avoiding immune destruction, change in the way cells metabolize. Um, uh, or carry out metabolism, how blood vessels are grown because which leads to growth of tumors, how the way the cancer spreads, how certain cells become immortal, and how certain changes in the DNA, whether they be chemical changes or structural changes in the DNA, actually impacts how cancer develops. So in our group at RCSI, our key focus really is asking two, three different questions. How is inflammation a precursor to the way cancer develops? how mutations and other chemical modifications on the DNA within the cancer cells impact cancer growth. And finally, how do these factors ultimately impact in the way cancer spreads from the primary site to secondary sites in the body? Now, what Rebecca has really nicely touched upon is she's made my job quite easy in the sense in talking about bowel cancer and the particular bowel cancer that my group focuses on is on the is in, in the large intestine or the colon and the rectum. And together, this cancer is really called as colorectal cancer. So if you look at the incidence of colon cancer across the world, what is very interesting to see really is that over the past two to three decades, the incidences of colon cancer has really significantly increased in the Western side of the world. Whereas if you look at the East, east of the world, or let's say generally the developing countries, the, um, the incidence of colon cancer are actually quite low. So if you look at the way colon cancer develops, normally we divide the colon cancer spread into four different stages. So we would normally call them uh, stage one, uh, stage zero, stage one, two, three, and then four. And this completely depends upon the way a polyp, which basically is a precursor to development of the tumor develops, followed by the tumor essentially, uh, which starts to grow and grows in size and ultimately reaches, reaches the stage four side, which is when the, the, the cells from this primary tumor essentially spread to other organs like the liver, say for instance. So if you look at, and, and this process of the disease spreading to the other organ is what we call as metastasis. So if you look at the National Cancer Registry of Ireland and look at the survival rates of patients who have colorectal cancer, what we really see is that there is, there is a very stark difference in the survival rates of stage one, two, and three patients. As you can see here, the survival rates are all the way from between 67 to 95%. Whereas in stage four patients, from these are patients where the cancer essentially has spread to other organs like the liver, the survival rate is actually quite poor. It's as low as 12%. And this sort of you know, kind of gives us an idea in terms of how our understand how kind of uh, poorly understood this particular cancer spread really is. So the first question that we try to answer in our lab, uh, which we started a couple of years ago, is that why do certain anti-cancer drugs not work as they are expected? 
And to answer this question, we need to look at the fact that how do drugs actually work within the actual uh, within the tumor cells? So if you look over here, you've got your when you treat a patient with a drug, the idea is that the drug actually goes into the tumor and this drug then starts killing the cell and as a result of which the tumor will shrink. However, often that is not the case. And why that is not the case is that once the drug enters a tumor cell, the, the environment within the tumor often results in the drug prematurely breaking down, even before it actually is able to carry out its function of cell death. And as a result of which the drug becomes ineffective and the tumor essentially grows in size. And one such example of an FDA approved drug is a drug called Belinostat or Belodac, as it is commonly called. This drug is USA FDA approved for the treatment of T cell lymphoma, which is a blood based cancer. Now, what we normally would see is that this particular drug, despite being very effective in T cell lymphoma, does not actually work in solid tumor malignancies or solid tumor based cancers like colon cancer. So the question or the challenge for us is how do we prevent this premature breakdown of the drugs in the tumors? So what we essentially did was in collaboration with our Department of Chemistry at RCSI, we took this particular molecule of bilinostat that you can see over here. This is the chemical structure of the bilinostat. And the particular, uh, particular part of bilinostat, which becomes very susceptible to this early breakdown, is this particular group that is called hydroximate. So very cleverly, what the Department of Chemistry really did was they essentially coupled this bilinostat molecule with copper. And this then allowed us to develop this particular compound called copper bisbilinostat, where copper here is at the center and you've got two molecules of bilinostat that is conjugated to it. So what does this really do? What it really does is conjugation or addition of this copper molecule to the two molecules of bilinostat protects this hydroximate group from early breakdown and early degradation. And more importantly, the copper essentially will now act as a molecule to protect the function of bilinostat. And we ultimately call this copper with bilinostat. So what we then did was we did a series of experiments using the same kind of cells that Rebecca had mentioned in her presentation, where we essentially took colon cancer cells from patients and grew them in culture. And what we did was we treated these cells with this novel molecule, copper with bilinostat. So what did we find? What we found was that once copper bisbilinostat enters the tumor cell, the copper molecule dissociates or remove itself from the bilinostat in a very slow manner, ultimately preventing this bilinostat from premature degradation. And once this bilinostat molecule is then released, it then blocks a very important enzyme within the cell or a very important protein. Blocking this protein has significant impacts on the tumor DNA and ultimately what this does is it, it switches on genes that are supposed to perform functions like anti-tumor functions and it switches off genes that are essentially are important or, or, or are involved in the growth of tumor. And as a consequence of this, we actually see a direct impact on cancer cells when the cancer cells essentially start to die. So what we essentially have done is we've taken an FDA approved drug, modified it such that its premature breakdown in the cancer cell is reduced significantly, making the drug effective and ultimately leading to cancer cell death. This preliminary evidence that we have actually generated over the last couple of years has now given a strong reasoning and rationale to progress this onto the next phase of clinical testing. So while we were actually doing this, another kind of important question that our lab really was interested to ask was, why is there a disparity in response to treatment and cancer patient? And when we talk about disparity, this is disparity not just in terms of patients, why certain patients respond to certain drugs and certain patients don't, but we need to start looking at how these patients are so different. And this question really kind of brings us into the era of what we call as imprecision medicine. So if you look at our current clinical practices or the cl cl uh, clinical practice that have, been ha that have been carried out to date, what we know is that if we take a group of patients, say all the patients having colon cancer, the previous idea here was that if you take one given type of treatment and you treat all these patients with that treatment, you would kind of expect a similar sort of effect. In fact, that is not the case, where in certain instances, the drug may work. However, in certain instances, the drug might not work. And in certain instances, the patients might even develop adverse effect to this drug. And this is what we call as imprecision medicine. And what we are now trying to do really is we're trying to depart from this 
era of imprecision medicine and move into the era of precision medicine. And here, instead of looking at all of these colon cancer patients at the same time or looking at them as a group of patients who have the same type of cancer, we now start looking at the makeup of individual patients. Here, we are looking at the genetic factors, at their socioeconomic factors, in, uh, also in terms of their, their ethnic backgrounds as well. And ultimately, what this is giving us is it is telling us how each of these colon cancer patients are different from each other. And by doing so, we are able to, in fact, tailor the treatment option and tailor the treatment option based on these genetic fact, based on these different factors and ultimately improving the impact of these treatment options. So while we, were, while we kind of move ourselves into the area of precision medicine, one of the factors that is quite important for us to understand is that a lot of the times when we look at or we evaluate drugs in a clinical setting, we often forget that each of these patients comes from a different, different ethnic background or a different ancestry background. And in particularly in colon cancer, what is known is that colon cancer patients who are, who are from African ancestry, in fact, show poor prognosis compared to patients, uh, compared to colon, colon cancer patients or who are of European ancestry where they display better prognosis. So our question really was that why is this or what are the factors that are in fact driving this different prognosis between these two ethnic groups of patients? So to answer this question, we actually moved on to one of the most powerful tools that have been developed over the last two decades, which we call as the Cancer Genome Atlas. This Cancer Genome Atlas really is a compendium of genetic data derived from over 20,000 patients that have been collected across the globe from various different centers. It's a compendium of about 20 different cancer types. And the idea behind this Cancer Genome Atlas is to understand um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, how each patient is different from each other, and more importantly, identify new targets of treat drug treatment and new ways to diagnose or improve diagnosis of patients. So using this compendium of data, we ask two questions. What kind of genes are turned on or turned off between these two patients of the different, uh, different ancestry groups? And more importantly, are there differences in anti-cancer immunity between these patients? So what did we find? What we do find really is that in the in, in colon cancer patients who have of African ancestry, they in fact have lower levels of a particular kind of immune cell molecule called killer T cells. Very similar to what Rebecca described in, in her presentation previously, these cells are really important to fight uh, for the body to fight against the cancer that is developed. So what we see here is that colon cancer patients of African ancestry, in fact, have lower levels of this killer T cells, and therefore they have a lower anti-cancer immunity. This, when you compare this to essentially colon cancer patients who come from a European ancestry, they in fact have a much higher or abundant levels of killer T cells and ultimately they, they have a higher anti-cancer immunity. So the question then for us was, what is driving this difference in anti-cancer immunity between these two patient, sub, uh, patient subtypes? And what we find essentially is that we've identified these molecules which are called as master regulators. And these master regulators, in fact, impact a series of different genes that are switched on and switched off, which ultimately contribute towards this immunity. And therefore, the idea behind this is now that we've identified these master regulators, these master regulators have now can be now regarded as really key um, targets that where you can essentially develop tre uh, treatment options for. This work, was, which is essentially a, a very significant collaborative approach, was published um, uh, earlier this year in, in Gastro Advances, and it is free, freely available for the public to essentially go and, and, and look at the paper as it is on an open access journal. So before I end my talk, I just wanted to kind of highlight something, something that again Rebecca had touched upon in her presentation, is that how collaboration really is the, has become the strength of cancer research, not just in Ireland, but, but across the globe. And indeed, what we are doing in RCSI is, is really a prime example of this. So what we do have is that we work very closely with our clinical colleagues at the various different hospitals within Ireland, more importantly, have developed very strong links with academic experts across the globe, both within Europe as well as in the United States, develop important um, collaborations with industry who ultimately will allow us to move this research from bench to bedside, and more importantly, and in fact, actually most importantly, work very closely with our funding bodies, such as the Irish Cancer Society, to kind of you know, to kind of develop these projects further.
And while we do this, the ultimate idea or the goal for us really is that if we take the patient, which is at the center of our focus, and as this patient's journey continues from diagnosis to treatment and then follow up, using the data that we generate within our lab, looking at chemical modifications on the DNA, the idea would be to improve diagnosis of patients and improve the treatment options as well. So with that, I'd like to thank a number of people, my group particularly, and I've highlighted Ellen Finnegan, who's really pioneered this entire work, um, this work that I've showed in terms of the Bellinostat work, um, our number of different collaborators, both within Ireland and as well as um, in, the, in, in, the, in the US and Europe, as well as people from our CSI as well, and our funding bodies. And more importantly, before I end, I just wanted to extend a very, very massive thank you to all the patients, the patient advocates and the public for continuously supporting the Irish Cancer Society in their efforts over these last year, last couple of years. COVID has been particularly challenging for researchers and funding bodies as well. But I think the, the fact that we have a continued support from these different groups really makes a massive difference in the way we actually work. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ditri. That was a fantastic talk and it's really, really interesting research. Um, I think I'll start off with a question. Um, sure. How far away do you think we are from having this kind of precision medicine in the clinic? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's a great question. So I think attempts are being made at the minute. So we're kind of at the stage of looking at each patient and trying to understand how they are different. And based on that, they, there are two kinds of things that you can do. One is you can actually prescribe them a specific kind of treatment. The other thing you can also do is if you are able to preempt earlier on, you can actually spare the patients from unwanted side effect of drugs that are ultimately are not going to work in the patients. So a lot of different clinics across, in fact, in, in Canada particularly, they have started to imp uh, implement precision medicine in the clinic. We have also tried to do that in Ireland, but I think we are kind of progressing slowly, in fact, but however, we still are progressing. So I would say in the next few years, we should actually be st we should start seeing precision medicine being applied on, on, on a regular basis in a clinical setting. That's fantastic. A great achievement. Um, so we have another question here and it says great presentation. And um, what would you say is the highlight of your research so far? Um, I think the highlight of the research really is that once we are actually able to get findings like what I've shared today and sharing it with people, I think it's the follow up, um, you know, it's the follow up conversations that start after that in terms of how to progress this further. So I think the highlight really has been for us is actually working very strongly with the patient groups, understanding where the need really is and that informing our research. I think that becomes really the highlight of what we do you know the research findings obviously follow from there but i think the fact that we're now starting to see improved ways of diagnosing patients so some of the work that you know that i had shared last year as well and the work that we've shared now is that you know the fact that we are now getting these newer options of treatments that we have we can take an earlier reaper drug that has already fda approved and potentially repurpose that for colorectal cancer similarly you know develop new ways of diagnosing i think that kind of becomes a highlight but i think more importantly the fact that all the work that we are doing is really informed by the patients in terms of what their needs are really kind of makes our, our research you know important and more so worthwhile doing really. That's fantastic and we have another question here from Rob who says do you know what the ethnic difference in immune cell levels that's balanced are combined to bowel cancer or are the differences in cellular immunity more general challenges? So I think particularly in bowel cancer that has been highlighted that the anti-cancer immunity is, is different between patient groups, mm -hmm. but it has been noted in other cancer types as well, for instance, prostate and breast cancer as well. It has been noted, but I think this, the, the actual start differences in prognosis and the anti-cancer immunity is more pronounced in colon cancer, or bowel cancer rather compared to the other cancer types. That's fantastic. And we have another question here. So you said um, involving patients in your research has clearly made an impact on your research. Have you any advice for researchers looking to get involved with PPI? Yeah, I think PPI is something that we are all still learning, to be honest, mm -hmm. and I think it really has become the forefront of research. So I think that is, it is, it's a really important thing. One thing that I have been taught, I suppose, you know, over these last couple of years involving PPI is trying to involve PPI as early as possible you know is to try and engage in those conversations while the idea behind a project is very kind of nascent or very early in your head at that stage i would say is you know begin the discussions but it's also important like once you start the discussions is you know 
it's it's quite different in terms of the research that we do. We do a lot of lab based research, so not always, you know, from a PPI perspective, would you be able to kind of transmit everything onto the work that you're doing. So it's also kind of having that sort of a balance between what you can take from the from the patients and patients advocate into your research. But more importantly, once you have developed that idea with the with the patient advocates and the patient advocate groups, really, is to actually then imbibe that and build that through the project. So it's not just actually. So, you know, I suppose one important thing is PPI is not just presenting the work to the audience that in fact is the end point it's actually bringing to, building a research question in form from the patients integrating that into your research and then make making sure that at every stage as you develop these results you are constantly in interaction with those same people who've actually helped you develop that idea and it actually makes it into a full circle really you know and so that would be kind of my advice that's something that we, even we are learning and we're trying to you know try and do do the best we can from a ppi perspective Um, were you surprised by how beneficial you found the PPI in your research? Um, not really, to be honest. Yeah. I think this was something, I think it, it wasn't surprising because it was something that we weren't really, you know, we, uh, I think it, it, it rather than saying surprising, I would say it just strengthened our research more so. You know, I think we started seeing the research from a very different perspective altogether because often when you're in the lab or you're doing a particular piece of research, you're only focused on the science. So I think when you start looking at the patient's perspective, you know, we then start taking, getting a very important holistic idea and it brings translational research, you know, at the bench to bedside, as we commonly call it, at the forefront. So I think it is it, more than stress, surprising, it really significantly strengthened what we did. And more so, you know, we realized that what we are doing is actually for a very important purpose. Fantastic. That's brilliant. So I don't think we have any more questions, so I think we'll end it there. But thank you so much to Sadipta and Rebecca for these fantastic presentations. And um, we really appreciate it. And it's wonderful to see the translational research that's going on in bowel cancer in Ireland today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.